Where are you from? From the monastery of Rico. How long have you been doing this? For one year. And where are you going? To Lhasa. But it's at least 300 miles to Lhasa. How long will it take you? About three months. How many prostrations do you do a day? About 3,000. Per day? That's less than four miles. Prostrations are a spiritual exercise. They cleanse people of egotism, greed, aggression and ignorance. Tibetans make a pilgrimage to Lhasa at least once in their lives. There they pray for their spiritual leaders who fled the country in 1959 in the face of Chinese threats to destroy them. They honor and venerate Karmapa. Gyalwa Karmapa, the head of the long-established Kaju sect of Buddhism in Tibet, older than the sect of the Dalai Lama. Karmapa marched with more than 100 monks over the Himalayas into exile. Umtse, Karmapa's tutor, quickly formed a new monastic community and the ancient traditional teachings of Tibetan Buddhism continued to flourish. This place is called Rumtek, a monastery in Sikkim, which was then a little Buddhist kingdom north of India on the southern slopes of the Himalayas. The Rumtek monastery became the new headquarters of Karmapa in exile. Karmapa is the holder of the black crown, a symbol for his spiritual mastership. He is the living link of an unbroken chain of enlightened beings back to the historical Buddha Shakyamuni who lived in India in 700 BC. He is Buddha. Buddha Shakyamuni transmitted his qualities to his pupils, who also became enlightened and were able to help their pupils also to reach this state of self-liberation. In the 12th century, this chain of enlightened beings led to the first Karmapa, who then developed the unique ability to predict exactly and in writing his own reincarnation, as did the second Karmapa, and the third, and so forth, up to him, the present, the 16th incarnation of Karmapa. He died in 1981, at the age of 57. His body was cremated at Rumtek Monastery. It was a state funeral, and mourners gathered from all corners of the earth. Karmapa has millions of followers. He left behind four young representatives or interim regents. Shamar on the right, Situ on the left, Jamgon, and Gyalza, the youngest of the interim regents. Rainbows over the blue skies of Sikkim. For Tibetans, a sure sign that an enlightened being has left his body. In Buddhism,
Buddhism, death is not the end. Karmapa died with the promise that he would again give a clear sign by which he could be recognized in his new life. But for a long time, no clues were found. Until 11 years later, I got some kind of uh, one dream. Says the 14th Dalai Lama. The, 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 the location, the area where, where is he? the present is the government is born. But one valley is the naturally is the 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 because the, the stones and the pang lawns is the looks is a high altitude and then facing the south and there's some stream, small is beautiful streams uh, and that, that is the main, you see, main sort of, uh, the, the picture. There was someone there and told me, uh, actually, you see, without, without this phone, this is this someone, uh, some source, you see, they, telling to me, oh, this is the place where Kamapa is born. Where could this place be? How could it be found? is where Situ, one of Karmapa's four interim regions, made an interesting discovery. Pressured by the faithful, who hoped and expected that Karmapa had left some clues behind, Situ felt that he should open the talisman Karmapa had given him ten months before his death with the words, this will protect you and someday be useful. The late his son has gave me this protection. Uh, pouch in uh, early January 1981 and uh, one day it was snake here I opened that and I found uh, an envelope and the envelope have uh, red ink uh, letter saying that uh, this should be opened in the uh, iron horse year and then I was uh, very very happy and then after the, uh, after I offered the letter to three Rinpoche's in Rumtek in uh, uh, March 1992. Traditionally, then, uh, such I talismans are never opened. But since no one had found any indications of Karmapa's rebirth, he decided to open it after all. But the letter is still... Letter is in Rumtek, yes. Mm -hmm. Envelope and letter both in Rumtek. It's in the altar. Mm -hmm. Here in Rumtek Monastery, in the headquarters of the late Karmapa, this most important and holy document is protected by the Sikkim police, both from outside and inside. Absolutely no one has access to it. Only Karmapa himself, when he returns in his new incarnation, has the right to break these seals. But I have a copy here of the uh, sacred letter and uh, this is in Tibetan, so I will read this. Emma Ho, Rangrigni Kuntu De. Emma Ho, self-awareness is always bliss. The Dharmadhatu has no center nor edge. From here to the north and the east of the land of snow, is a country where divine thunder spontaneously blazes in a good nomad's place with the sign of a cow. Method is Dundup and wisdom is Lolaga, born in the year of the one used for the earth, with the miraculous far-reaching sound of the white one. This is the one known as Karmapa. He is sustained by Lord Drupa, 
Being non-sectarian, he pervades all directions. Not staying close to some and distant from others, he is the protector of all beings. When I discovered this, I was uh, very pleased. And actually it was uh, a tremendous relief. Uh, this is exactly uh, the blessing and uh, also inspiration of highest uh, aspect uh, which we have been waiting and uh, we are finally blessed by it. So we are, I, I was very, very happy. This letter was interpreted by Gyalsa on the left, Jamgon, Situ and Shamar on the right working together. They all came to a unanimous conclusion, which Gyalsa reads to us. From here to the north, in the east of the land of snow, we interpret here as Rumtek, where Kamapa wrote the letter. And in the east of the land of snow means we have to look for him in eastern Tibet, because land of snow is the Tibetan name for Tibet. Where divine thunder spontaneously blazes indicates a district in eastern Tibet. La means divine and Tok means thunder. There is only one community in eastern Tibet named La Tok. The letter describes the area more precisely as a good nomad place with the sign of a cow. Good means a fertile, beautiful nomadic area. This area must have a name which includes the syllable Kaur, meaning cow. The next line, method is Dundup and wisdom is Lolaga, predicts the names of the parents. It refers to the Buddhist symbolism. The sun symbolizes the masculine principle, method, and the moon symbolizes the female principle, wisdom. Therefore, the father must be named Dandup and the mother, Lolaga. Born in the year of the one used for the earth, prophesies the year of his birth. During the relevant period in the Tibetan calendar, there is, in addition to the snake, dragon, hare and tiger, only one animal sign used for the earth, the ox, 1985. The words, the miraculous far-reaching sound of the white one, refer to the white conch shell used in Tibetan religious music, which is always called the white one. Sustained by Lord Drupa, refers to Situ, whose Buddhist name of honor is Drupa. In his previous life, Situ had identified the last Karmapa and was chosen to exercise this function once again. With respect, so much for the moment. Chamgon, Karmapa's other interim regent. What do you personally think of the letter? Very precise. Do you think the information which the letter contains and how you interpreted it will enable you to find the reincarnation of Karmapa? Yeah, you could say that. Yes, it is very clear and very precise. And that's why we, we are very confident about, you know, finding of his own, mm. so in, you know, mm. yes. Because of visa problems, a copy of the letter is sent together with their interpretation to Tsurpu Monastery in Tibet. Tsurpu has been the seat of all Karmapas for 800 years. Drupon Dechen, the abbot of the monastery, gives Tomo the task of leading the search with the letter as guide. Take Ashang Lerdro with you and travel to Kham in eastern Tibet and then follow the directions in the letter. The reincarnation of Karmapa 
is something so unique. It's like an offering cup made of a pure blue Benshuya jewel. Hopefully, after 12 years of waiting, all our wishes are going to be fulfilled. The letter brings a blessing. For Tomo, it is the greatest task of his life. Only a handful of people know his mission, because indications and conditions could be manipulated and the search could therefore fail. As discreetly as possible, Tomo sets off on his long journey, together with his companions, the 70-year-old Ashang Letro with a white hat, Titi, his attendant, the driver, and Pato. No one in Tibet is allowed to travel without official permission. Therefore, Pato, in the black coat, a government officer, accompanies them. More than 1,000 miles to Latok, eastern Tibet, and several military checkpoints have to be passed. Patula. Patula, we'll simply say that you're on an official inspection trip and that you were kind enough to take us along. Tomula. Tomula, we won't tell anyone what we're looking for. We'll pretend to be pilgrims. The job they have to do is very risky because searching for a reincarnation is condemned as a superstitious activity by the Chinese and severely punished. Therefore, they have to keep the reason for their journey strictly secret. And if they really find Karmapa, their hope is that Karmapa will protect them. Karmapa is not like an ordinary reincarnation. He's a living Buddha, and the Chinese would provoke an uprising in Tibet if they chose to condemn him, as they did up to now with many others. For 30 years, the Tibetans had been strictly forbidden to practice their religion. In the meantime, however, a very few selected monasteries have been given permission to rebuild. The monasteries were centers of education for everyone. The country on the roof of the world is as big as Western Europe, or a quarter of the US, but with only six million inhabitants. Since 1960, Beijing has been oppressing Tibet with half a million soldiers and colonizing it with what are by now eight million new Chinese settlers. More than a million Tibetans have been killed. The country has been looted. Tibet's natural resources are plundered and nearly all the big wild animals have been wiped out. Before the Chinese started to build roads, one could see great herds of antelopes, wild donkeys, and yaks. Today, only a few birds are left. Tibetans do not kill animals just for fun or profit. It would be against their faith. The majority are nomads who live with and not against nature. Large that it takes a whole day to cross. If the jeep has a breakdown, there is no one who can help. It is so cold that in the morning one can drive over frozen rivers, but by midday they're thawed out again, and these extremes of temperature are repeated day after day. This is a search where nothing may go wrong. The monks from Tsurpu bear an enormous responsibility. If they're not able to find Karmapa, they will disappoint millions of people whose faith in reincarnation as a law of nature will be deeply shaken.
The search party now has to proceed on horseback because there are no roads into the district of Lato. They need four riding horses and one pack horse for at least two weeks. Horses are rare and not easy to get, but with friendly words, they quickly come to terms. Before drinking, one always sacrifices a few drops to the hungry spirits. It's a beer made out of barley or salty butter tea, which tastes like a greasy broth. The horses of the Himalayas are pretty small, but they're tough. Without giving themselves away, the men continue the search. Now the arduous part of the journey begins. A day's ride to Latok over high passes and through dangerous ravines. The monks of Tsurpu have sent Officer Pato on ahead to see if the coast is clear and to find accommodations in Latok. After three days in the saddle, Pato reaches Latok. Above the village is the Kalek Monastery, which was completely destroyed by the invaders in 1966 and recently rebuilt. <laughs> The abbot, Lama Palden, welcomes the camouflaged pilgrims from Tsurpu. He spent 25 years in prison. Now he again looks after all the little boys sent to the monastery for education. Could Karmapa already be among them? Lama Palden, do you have any unusual children? Recently, many children from the area have again begun to enter the monastery, and although I'm able to see if a child has special skills and qualities, I'm not able to see who they've been in their previous lives. Tradition says that there have been earlier incarnations of Karmapa who identified themselves with their very first words, I am Karmapa. In the case of such a child, however, his personal data always had to correspond exactly with the indications in the letter of prophecy. Tomo and Lodro not only interviewed monks, they also talked to people outside the monastery. They asked me about a place with Kor in its name. Yes, I said. Pakor, the valley of the cow, isn't far from here. And they wanted to know if there was a woman named Lolaga. Yes, there is. And her husband is called Dundup. The men said they were relatives and wanted to know all about their children. So I told them Lalaga and Dundup had six daughters and three sons. The oldest must have been born in the year of the hare, the middle one in the year of the ox, and the youngest in the year of the pig. When they heard all that, one of them folded his hands and began to weep. Early the next day, they ride on. If everything goes well, they can reach Pakor the same day. Twelve years of waiting, and now only one more pass to cross.
Hawaii where only nomads live. Here there are neither houses, nor mail, nor electricity. The men from Tsurpu find it hard to imagine that their enlightened Karmapa, the Buddha, could have chosen this of all places for his reincarnation. What reasons might he have? Could this be Lulaga? People here still live the way they did in primeval times. <laughs> Finally, the search party finds its way to the tent of Dandup and Lolaga. If what they've heard is true, then their middle son, who was born in the year of the ox, must be Karmapa. in the sacred letter and the facts as they find them here are exactly the same. The dream of the Dalai Lama has been confirmed. One valley and some stream, small and beautiful streams. There was someone there and told me, oh, this is the place where Kamal was born. Three years after the 16th Karmapa had to flee from the Chinese invaders and Turpu was completely destroyed, the 17th Karmapa returns once again to his ancestral home. Karmapa's power to consciously change from one life to another is something which evokes deep devotion and respect among Tibetans. They don't see him as a child, they see him as a person who bears with him the wisdom of 16 lives in Buddhahood. He's being shown his throne in the great hall of prayer. No, not the little one, the large one over there. Having been informed immediately that Karmapa had been found, Situ comes to greet him. With him is Gyaltsa, one of the interim regents. They come to welcome the new Karmapa. moments such as this don't happen spontaneously. They are subject to a strict traditional ritual. 
the chief tutor and master of ceremonies of the previous Karmapa in Rumtik. How much does Karmapa remember about Umtse and all the others who were so familiar to him in his previous life? And this is the occasion for the official photograph to commemorate Karmapa's successful reincarnation. The news spreads quickly all over the world. Karmapa's personality and his unique abilities arouse much interest in the West. Without any effort on his part, his appearance coincides with a general surge of interest in Buddhism outside Asia. The little son of Tibetan nomads from Latok is officially recognized by the Dalai Lama as the true reincarnation of Karmapa. What was the basis for your recognition? So what, what usually I do is I do not, you see, they're relying on just one or two, you see, the test. So, you see, I uh, proceed some, my usual method regarding as the, the choosing reincarnation. Then the indication is positive. So then I decided. Okay, that's good. Ultimately, a Karmapa proves himself by his deeds. The letter of prophecy said that he would not be staying close to some and distant from others. He is the protector of all beings. A few of the holes are quite deep. Some Kamapas left the impressions of their fingers in the stone to prove the power of mind over matter. The Chinese left gaping holes in the wall, which prove their faith in the power that comes from the barrel of a gun and demonstrate their hatred of religion. Religion in Tibet is something altogether different from what Marx, Mao, or other materialists meant by it. Buddhism is not the opium of the people. Buddhism made the people gentle and peaceful. This makes their brutal fate particularly tragic and bitter. Is this the Karmapa's house? It was in this little house that the first Karmapa began his line of reincarnations. At that time, in the 12th century, there was no monastery, only wilderness. He meditated in here for decades in order to become master of his own spirit. All of the 16 Karmapas were clearly identified by the prophecies they left behind in their previous life. 
And in this way, the line of reincarnations has remained unbroken for 800 years. The first Karmapa became famous for his miracles. And a monastery grew up around his modest little house at Surpul. Like the first Karmapa, his successors withdrew from monastic life to the seclusion of their hermitages and caves. These still existing places of retreat are objects of veneration for pilgrims. Most of them are still in use. Surviving here in the winter at temperatures of minus 40 degrees is proof enough of extraordinary spiritual power. It was in this hermitage, along with his mother, that the 10th Karmapa spent 30 years meditating. In each life, again and again, the Karmapas, through profound discipline, attained that clear-sightedness which enabled them to see beyond the borders of death. This is the cave where the 10th Karmapa meditated during most of his life. Reincarnation aside, all the little boys previously identified by the letters of the deceased Karmapas turned out to be outstanding personalities, musicians, poets, engineers, philosophers, who also had the gift of prophecy. The ninth Karmapa sat here and left the imprint of his back in the rock. Those who rub against it are sometimes healed of disease. Meditation without any distraction is the only means of transcending the limits of the body. In order to achieve highest enlightenment, the seventh Karmapa had himself walled in here for seven years. Without words or eye contact, food and drink was given to him through a hole in the wall and left him through another opening in the bottom of his tiny stone box where he could not stretch his legs. At an elevation of 15,000 feet, the second Karmapa had his hermitage. This house even survived an earthquake and the attacks by the Chinese in 1966. It is a testimony to the strength of Tibetan Buddhism that despite everything which has happened in recent years, the 17th Karmapa is able to once again reclaim his ancestral home and give new life to it. By thus dying and returning in a new body and with a new nationality, he surmounts political borders which would have been impossible to cross with the same body and as an exile. This is his first outing on horseback since he has returned to Tsurpu. 
It takes him to the lower garden and passes by the protective deity Mahakala, who watches over the teachings of Buddha at the gates of Tsurpu. Four hundred years before the birth of the first Karmapa, Padmasambhava, the founder of Tibetan Buddhism, made a prophecy which said that completing the work of Karmapa would require 21 reincarnations. Urgent Tinli is the 17th of the predicted 21 Karmapas. There's something in there. A demon lives in this stone. He has to be got rid of, or else something awful will happen. Can't it wait until tomorrow? No, now. Take him out and don't get tired. I'll show you where he has to go. Here, that's where he should be buried. But the wall might cave in if we remove the stone. Shouldn't we support it? No. Very well then, let's begin. In Tibet, it is not at all unusual for demons to take possession of a stone and spread evil from there. The breaking of such stones in a special ceremony which forces the demon to flee is quite common. Apparently this demon is particularly unpleasant and the Karmapa wants him buried. <laughs> He's to get a decent funeral. <laughs> Only monks are allowed to dig his grave. <laughs> and he's to be given a bed of flowers. <laughs> Here he will find peace. And what will the melody? Stay there and calm down. Did he just imagine all this? Or does he have a kind of perception which we lack?
<laughs> C2 and Gyaltsap have arrived. They have planned something special for today. A vacation from the monastery can last for a couple of days. The Tibetans love picnics and outdoor activities. The 12th C2 and the 17th Karmapa have rediscovered a friendship which has lasted through 12 lifetimes, stronger than any family tie. <laughs> At a party like this, even someone as austere as Gyalsa, one of the interim regions, can become playful. A form of stately Tibetan rock and roll. The surprise is ready. Now Kamapa can come in. It's too dangerous for predators like these, armed with savage teeth and claws, to indulge in. A generator, a television set, and a video recorder have been brought from Laza especially for today. continually on tap, there's less competition at feeding time. These two domestic cats are operating in the same way, like overcrowded lions. Between them, they have 12 kittens, and it's a free-for-all as He's never as seen machines like this before, at least not in this life. Situ has brought along a special film, which he now shows Kamapa. It's a film about the 16th Kamapa. Three rooms have already been prepared. Ranjan Rikpa Dorje, the last Kamapa, was born in Tibet in 1924. He fulfilled the prophecies of Padma Sambhava, who also foretold in the 8th century Sorapu Monastery will be the center of the activity of the successive Kamapas, who by their activity would liberate inconceivable numbers of sentient beings. Many thousands of families in Tibet have close links with the Kamapas and have always given generously to the monastery. Tibetans are sure that the new incarnation of the Gyalva Karmapa will one day come back here to Tsurku. In 1974, the 16th Karmapa blessed Westerners for the first time.
On arriving in the United States, he went to Oribe in the Arizona desert to pay his respects to the Native Americans of the Hopi tribe. The Hopis have an ancient prophecy which says that when the man with the red hat comes, a bridge of wisdom will be built between east and west. After Karmapa's visit, the Hopi called a meeting of all their medicine men. They confirmed that Karmapa had fulfilled their prophecy. Karmapa then traveled to a number of American cities. After he left, centers for Tibetan Buddhism were founded there. involved in this continuity of the spirit what is it that persists from one life to another levels of consciousness certain types of behavior belief in a direct connection between one life and another is made possible by our own personal subjective experience the Buddhists believe that every human being is the focal point of a spiritual as well as a biological heritage. Karmapa is spiritually descended from Karmapa. Biologically, this is his father, Karma Dundup Tashi, age 54. And this is his mother, Lolaga Poldozum, age 46. They are nomads in eastern Tibet, in the province of Kham, in the Latok district. And this is the Pakur Valley. The family have been living here for generations. By the time Karmapa was born in 1985, Lolaga had already given birth to seven children. There were six daughters, today aged between 10 and 25. <coughs> they were all born in quick succession after the birth of her eldest son, Rapsal. Together with the grandmother, 12 people live in this tent. The climate up here at 14,000 feet is one of extremes. The temperatures range from 40 below zero to more than 100 above. After having a fourth daughter, the family had longed for a second son. When their sixth child turned out to be another daughter, they decided to have a serious consultation with the old abbot of the Kalak Monastery. He gave them instructions to help them get a second son. Help those in need every day, feed the fish in the river and the birds and the stray dogs. And in addition, they were to say the prayer of refuge 111,000 times. But when yet another daughter was born, the old abbot had died. Lama Paldin became his successor, 
and he gave them the same advice. In addition, he recommended a pilgrimage to Lhasa. The father traveled to central Tibet, while the mother stayed home with the family and continued to pray. <laughs> After 50,000 prayers, Lolanga was pregnant. The family prayers were intensified. The father said tens of thousands, but the largest number, more than a thousand a day, were said by the grandmother. She tells how, at the birth of her daughter, there had already been signs that Lolaga would greatly benefit Buddhism. She always offered to Buddha the first bowl of tea. Now Buddha is part of her family. Her devotion is nevertheless the same. In the rough climate of Tibet, 20 or more cups of salted butter tea every day are a matter of survival. Their main food is tsampa, barley flour kneaded with butter tea. In addition, they eat a fair amount of meat. Vegetables do not grow up here. Their oldest son, Rapsel, 27, is responsible for the herds. Kamapa's family owns about 90 yaks. This is enough to supply their own needs and produce surplus meat and butter which they can trade for the barley grown in the lowlands. They use every part of the animal, not just the meat and milk. The hair of the yak is spun into the threads with which they make their tents. The fur itself is made into blankets and coats, which are worn winter and summer. Nothing is thrown away. For the Tibetans, nature is sacred. In 1985, the summer pasture of the Karmapa family was only one valley away. Four times a year, the family packs up and moves the herds to new grazing lands. They set up their tents there in early June. In the last month of Lolaga's pregnancy. The 111,000 prayers still hadn't all been said. Anxiously, they asked themselves, will it be a boy this time? She dreamt of three white cranes who brought her a golden letter from Padmasambhava, the founder of Buddhism in Tibet. They told her to keep the letter secret until the time was right.
This is the place and the tent. Here is where Karmapa was born on the 26th of June, 1985. It was an easy birth, shortly before sunrise on a beautiful morning. I can't explain it, but the evening before there was a rainbow over the tent, even though the sun had already set. Naturally, I had no idea that the child was Karmapa. But the many wondrous signs which accompanied his birth made us very happy and gave us the certainty that this child would be of great benefit to Buddhism. At his birth, the king of birds landed on our tent and sang a wonderful song. On the third day after his birth, we also suddenly heard conch shell horns resounding everywhere. At first I thought it was an aeroplane. Everyone around here heard it. His sound lasted for an hour and a half. Our neighbors, the Sipas, the Tsewogs and the Chudzoms will tell you the same thing. I looked out, but I couldn't see anything. We questioned the neighbors. Were you here when Lolaga's second son was born? Yes, naturally. Did you notice anything unusual? Oh, yes, it was very strange. Suddenly, everywhere in the valley, you could hear a sort of droning sound. I thought it was a swarm of bees. But there was nothing to be seen. It lasted for two hours. When I was outside, I thought the sound came from inside. And when I was inside, I thought it came from outside. Excuse me, could we ask you a question? When Lolaga's second son was born, can you remember hearing anything unusual? Was there any special sound? Everywhere, everywhere. I thought a high lama had come riding into the valley and that an orchestra was accompanying him with lots of conch shells. We looked all around. The music could be heard everywhere. I couldn't tell where the sound was coming from. There was no lama either. Nothing. Just this loud music in the air. How long did it last? About two hours. And when was that? Summer, in the year of the ox, I think. Yes, she's right. The Chokang Temple in Lhasa is the focus of Tibet's spiritual strength. It is located below the Potala, the Dalai Lama's palace. Here in the Chokang temple, Karmapa's hair will be cut ceremonially, a symbolic act showing his bond to Buddha. Normally, this rite is performed in front of a higher lama, but Karmapa does it at the feet of the Chovo. Chovo is the most revered Tibetan statue of the historical Buddha, Chakyamuni. This is only the second time in Tibet's history that a Kamapa has celebrated his hair-cutting ceremony here in the holiest place in Tibet. Kamapa is receiving his personal Buddhist name for this life, Urgen Tinli Dorje, plus nine other names. Now the time has come. Situ cuts off a few hairs and Urgen Tinli Dorje becomes a monk. That a religious ceremony such as this could take place with the knowledge of the Chinese occupiers 
also has its political consequences. The fact is that the Chinese consider reincarnation pure superstition. Even so, they recognize Urchin Tinli as Karmapa. And what's more, they do so only because their political enemy, the Dalai Lama, has identified him as the true reincarnation. In view of the fact that the Dalai Lama cannot visit Tibet, and it is forbidden to even mention his name, the Tibetans were immensely gratified to see Karmapa officially receive the Dalai Lama's congratulatory scarf, or katak, in full view of the Chinese occupiers. Tibet now has a spiritual leader who is inside the country and who is closely connected to the Dalai Lama. This is only a first step, but it is a hopeful sign for the survival of Buddhism in Tibet. In order for Karmapa to travel freely throughout the world to meet his many followers and complete the work of the 16th Karmapa, he will have to perform a delicate political balancing act between China, occupied Tibet and the outside world. If it is possible for someone to decide where and when his spirit will enter another body, then one might ask why Karmapa actually chose to be born here in Pakor. He could have been born in Sikkim, or in the United States where he died, or as a Bhutanese prince. But nothing like that. These were his playmates. They lived almost identical lives, and yet he is completely different. Was it his sense of compassion that moved Karmapa to choose this place, these people, and this martyred land for his rebirth? His mother, Lolaga, has only animal dung as fuel for cooking and heating the tent. She has to pound it flat for drying. When she was a child, she collected dead wood in the forests around here. It's hard to believe that this area, like all the enormous expanses of eastern Tibet, was once a huge forest, full of trees so large that it took several men with outstretched arms to encircle them. What happened to the trees? In my childhood, there was a dense forest here. But during the last decades, all the forests have been cut down. One mountain after another has been stripped. Here, there are only tree stumps. This is all we have left. The trees have all been floated to China, and now nothing grows here. It's terrible. This little tree was planted by Karmapa shortly before he went to Tsurku. The spring here had almost completely dried up, and we didn't have water left for ourselves and our herds. Now it's bubbling again. Karmapa conducted a ceremony in front of his freshly planted tree. 
If he hadn't saved the spring, the summer pasture up here would have been lost and we would have had to move down to the river to find water for our animals. But there the grass has all been eaten away. Umse was in close contact with the 16th Karmapa throughout his life. He went into exile with him in Sikkim, and now, at the age of 72, he has returned to Tsurpu. Karmapa often doesn't feel like school, but there are some texts which he knows by heart after only one reading. It was June 15th, the day Karmapa arrived, that our abbot Dripon Dechen told me I was to teach Karmapa. Traditionally, one starts with the alphabet, but he'd learned all that at home already. When he wants to, he can learn well and fast. He's very much like the 16th Karmapa. He loves birds, he likes to play. His mentality is like that of his predecessor. Later, he will study metaphysics at the very highest level. And someday, he will have a lot of monks to educate, so he'll have to become a great master himself. He will be a leader who frees people from their suffering and brings them great happiness. He is the living Buddha. He embodies Buddha's teachings and will disseminate them in all realms of existence. He will achieve great things. But at the moment, he is a child, and so there are still things that I can teach him. Later, this will no longer be the case. I will serve him as long as I am able to. I am not a master myself, so there isn't much that I can give him. Besides, I'm old and frail. I could be dead in a month or in one or two years, one doesn't know. In the future, he'll determine his own activities. They will depend on the power of his spirit and the greatness of his compassion and on the degree of his enlightenment. Enlightenment is neither a present nor an accident. In his former lives, Karmapa achieved it through selflessness. It is said that the 16th Karmapa accepted his cancer out of love for the people of the West. He spent his last days in this American hospital. Watching as a physician uh, an unstoppable illness ravage his body and yet this kindness that never stopped. Every morning I would go in and ask him, are you having pain? And he'd smile at me and say, no, no pain, no pain. It was very confusing to the staff. It was obvious he wasn't just denying his illness. So the staff was constantly confronted with this person who was dying, but was still more interested in how they felt than in how he felt. Karmapa died on November the 5th, 1981. His principal students invited me into the room and had me hold my hand over his holiness's uh, heart area. And each day I was amazed to find that it stayed warm. Uh, I wasn't as amazed after 24 hours, but then after 48 and 72 hours, I was beginning to be uh, 
quite shocked. Traditionally, after, um, shortly after death, the body becomes cold as the circulation stops. And in His Holiness's case, there was a definite warmth uh, over the area of the heart. As a physician, I have no explanation for this. Ever since his death, Karmapa's followers, both monks and lay people, have been praying that he might quickly return to earth in human form. is not obliged to reincarnate. He is free of all the confusion, anxiety, and attachments which drive people compulsively back into a body. Karmapa only returns when there are many who need him and ask for his help. His spirit moves freely, independent of whether he has a body or not. The famous thousand-year-old Tibetan Book of the Dead teaches that experience is based upon projection. The projection is the image of the world we make for ourselves and which we call reality. According to this traditional teaching, the world of our experience is a dream. It's like watching a film which emotionally is very real for us, but has little to do with the reality of sitting in the cinema. Tibetans believe that, like this metaphor, experience continues after death. The projector is the spirit which cannot die. The show goes on, so to speak. If we become conscious that it is our mind which produces the film, the experience, then we can stop the projector of our mind and become aware that the true nature of our spirit is emptiness. But our restless thoughts begin projecting films all over again. And this happens not only in life, but also in death. The Tibetan Book of the Dead even says that experience during death without a body is seven times more intense. And it can be weeks before we realize that we've died. Usually, we realize it only because others can no longer perceive us. And we no longer leave traces in the sand. Then we understand. This is death. Though we do have the option to avoid all suffering by breaking the circle of reincarnation. Or else to return to the world in the hope of rediscovering our accustomed reality. We again pursue our projections and search for ourselves. But there's nothing there. So the solution is a new body. But a new body does not mean a new start. It's just a continuation of the fate we have created for ourselves. Karmapa says, don't be afraid of death. Death does not put an end to our experience.
Life and death are like a river without a beginning or an end. Sometimes water, sometimes ice. The family sets out to Tsurpu to be present at the enthronement of their son as the new living Buddha. Even Karmapa's little brother is going along. The family had been longing for a second son for so many years. And now, as Karmapa, he's left them. The last born child is again a son and a comfort to them. His mother breastfed Karmapa for three years. The little boy had what we normally describe as a happy childhood. His six older sisters contributed to his well-being. Immediately after he was born, his mother sent one of his sisters to fetch water at the river. When the sister came back, she said a magpie had just given her the name of her new brother, Abogaga. And so, for the first seven years of his life, until his discovery, he was called Abogaga. After a journey which lasted 10 days, first on horseback and then by jeep, the family arrives in Surpu, only a few days before the enthronement. For the first time, the family meets their little Abogaga as the great Karmapa. Karmapa is now as much an object of reverence for them as for everyone else. They cope with this situation neither with pride nor with sadness, but with respect and humility. More than once, Abu Gaga's father had offered him an education, a Tibetan euphemism for a spanking. Now, of course, he regrets it. Isn't the little boy sad about being separated from his family? He seems to feel completely comfortable being Karmapa and being the boss here. He already had his seven years of untrammeled and happy childhood with his family and he doesn't seem to miss them. From now on, the relationship between him and his family will be restricted to short visits like this. For the last 48 hours, the throngs of pilgrims have been pouring into Tsopu. The news that Karmapa has returned and that he will be enthroned at the eighth new moon has spread like wildfire. For Tibetans, the new moon is always a good time to begin something. It is then that the male and female energies are in harmony. Most of the trucks come from enormous distances, sometimes more than a thousand miles. It's no wonder then that many of the trucks give up the ghost during the final struggle up the last few feet to Tsurpu. <laughs> the day before the enthronement, Huge quantities of gifts arrive, which other monasteries and sects have sent to the new Karmapa. Oh, 
Each item is recorded and exhibited. There's everything, from ritual objects to musical instruments, such as pipes and cymbals, to bags of herbs or pieces of brocade. It's dawn on the day when the Buddha will once again ascend his throne. It is the 27th of September, 1992. Kamapa doesn't seem to find these huge crowds very exciting. <laughs> There's an estimated 20,000 pilgrims, plus an official from Beijing. He comes with the order to turn this day into a political event. China recognizes the highest spiritual leader who lives in Tibet because China cannot afford another bloody uprising on the roof of the world. There are television crews from Beijing and Lhasa. The official presents Urgen Tinli Dorje with a red book of the Central Committee with the state seal of his recognition as the 17th Karmapa, the living Buddha. During their 800-year history, the Karmapas have been the most revered and esteemed teachers of the Chinese emperors. Therefore, the Chinese hope to find a Tibetan leader in the Karmapa who will perhaps alienate the Tibetans from the Dalai Lama. But Kamapa and Dalai Lama can never be played off against each other. Despite this, the official from Beijing insists that the Karmapa may not be given a seat higher than his own. The political aspect of this enthronement heralds a change. Now that reincarnation has been officially recognized, it can no longer be condemned and punished as superstition, and there will be at least some limits to the repression of Buddhism in Tibet. With our recognition, we show that our government respects the religious freedom of minorities, especially of Tibet. The politics of religious freedom is a stable and long-term one. Consequently, we hope to see a strengthened socialism and patriotism originating from the monks, religious believers and the monastery administrations. Tibetan Buddhism should be preserved. The political part of the ceremony has taken about half an hour and doesn't seem to have impressed the Tibetans. the Chinese delegation has departed, the Tibetans surge forward to take their places. The Buddha
hardest part of the enthronement can begin now. It is exactly noon and the stars are in an extraordinary constellation. Four fire signs in a row. This is the right moment which has been chosen for the enthronement in advance. The letter of prophecy which Karmapa had written in his previous life is now returned to him. Together with the letter of recognition from the Dalai Lama and the judgment of the Tibetan state oracle, it is presented to him in a yellow scarf. Karmapa is once again Karmapa. The 12th Tai Situpa addresses the Karmapa with his full name. His Holiness the 17th Gyalwa Karmapa Urgentinli Doje and presents him with the symbols of life. Grain, the symbol of fertility, red sand, the symbol of earth. All the various elements are presented to him to be touched. There are extensive explanations of the interrelatedness of everything within the universe. The mirror symbolizes the element of form because the mirror reflects only form. With this enthronement, Tsupu was and has remained the chief residence of the Karmapas, the living Buddhas. Visitors who couldn't get a seat inside the temple listen to the ceremony over loudspeakers. Among them are the parents of Karmapa. To Buddhists, they have no special importance and are no closer to the Buddha than anyone else. Seen from the point of view of reincarnation, a child's qualities are derived from his former life and not from his parents. To conclude the ceremony, Gyatsap celebrates the mandala offering. This means giving that which is dearest and most valuable, nothing less than the universe symbolized by piling rice on a mirror-like surface. Now everyone can enter the temple. No one may be excluded. They've all made the journey in order to see the Karmapa at least once. One good reason for the high throne is to keep the Karmapa from being crushed by the crowd. And somehow or other, the greeting scarves and personal gifts have to reach the Buddha himself. But finally, things are better organized. Everybody manages to walk directly past the Kamapa. They receive his blessing and can see him from close up. 
For Tibetans, merely having seen the Karmapa ensures that one won't be reborn as an animal. One can be sure of returning at least seven times as a human being and without having to endure a hard fate. In order to have a concrete sign of the spiritual gift they have received, each pilgrim is given a red thread which will protect him. The ceremony has lasted the whole day. After sitting still for eight hours, Karmapa is still ready for a joke. Next day, his family's visit is over. They set out on the long journey home, where they will go on with their nomadic life as before. Parting from his little brother is especially tender. <laughs> the family feels that Karmapa would have been too precious to keep for themselves and they gladly give him up for the benefit of others. Seven days, the pilgrims dance and celebrate to express their joy at Buddha's reincarnation. Karmapa is studying to hold his first initiation into Buddhism. It is to be his first public teaching, and during his life there will be many, many more, in Tibet and all over the world. This initiation emphasizes compassion for all sentient beings. It is preceded by a purification ritual.
The saffron water which Karmapa has blessed creates the connection between himself and everyone who is there. Essential qualities of the Buddha are perfect knowledge of the past, present and future and the wisdom to see the true nature of all phenomena. that there are no qualities or wisdom without compassion.